Oui, 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 on a ça. You need to tell me what you're seeing. Members of council, members of the executive management of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Desmond Wesley Gavender, family and friends of Professor Gavender, particularly Professor Desmond's uh, wife, of Irene Gavender, his two sons, Josh and Stanton, his daughter-in-law, Cherise, his one and only granddaughter, Ariella, his mother, Mama Sarah Gavender, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Professor Antlandam Kize. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor and the Head of the College of Humanities. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nanapogu, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Desmond Wesley Gavender. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Desmond Gavender. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture presents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professor. These lectures are further an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to proceed to present an overview of their own contribution to their field, to their academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. 
At this stage, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our Dean and Head of School, Professor Tabom Sivi, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Desmond Wesley Gavender. Thank you very much, Deputy Vice Chancellor. A good afternoon to everybody. This, uh, it is my singular honor uh, to be introducing one of the most distinguished scholars in education, Professor Gavender. Prof. Desmond Gavender is a professor in computer science education. After completing a teaching diploma, he started his career as an educator in mathematics and computer studies. During his teaching tenure, he continued his studies at UNISA and the former UTW, where he obtained his BCom and honors degrees in computer science, respectively. Thereafter, he lectured at the former Edward College for Teacher Education in Computer Science, and then was appointed as Provincial Subject Advisor for IT in the Department of Basic Education in Guazul Natal. In 2002, he joined the former University of Natal in the School of Mathematics, Science, Technology, and Computing Education in the Discipline of Computing Education as a senior lecturer and obtained his master's, in, a master's degree in digital media and PhD in information systems and technology at UKZM. He served as a head of school and assistant dean to the dean uh, for three years. He was then appointed to associate professor in 2016 and later to full professor in 2020. Professor Kavenda is an established NRF rated researcher who enjoys international recognition. He has supervised and graduated 16 PhD students as well as 10 master's students, and has published more than 75 articles in national and international peer reviewed journals uh, and in also in conference proceedings. He received three awards for research output from the College of Humanities, being a member of the top 30 researchers twice, and then in the School of Education for being a member of the top three researchers in 2018 and 2019, respectively. The niche areas of his research are programming paradigms and information and communications technology, which is ICT integration in teaching and learning. Recently, his concentration has been uh, on ICT integration in teaching and learning in the fourth industrial revolution. Presently, he is advisor to Umalusi, the Department of Basic Education, the Independent and Examinations Board uh, for the subject information technology in high schools. He is presently an external moderator for information technology in the country, which involves ensuring standards for IT of all examining bodies are maintained. This ties in with his involvement in teacher education for computer science. His international collaborations and advisory services include Wellington Institute of Technology in New Zealand, Midland State University in Zimbabwe, and an non-governmental organization in Zimbabwe called Solidemed, who are involved in an electronic health community program. His role has been to advise on the structure and design of system software development. At Midland State University, he, has, he was instrumental in offering computer science education courses into the BEAT program. Several bodies, including the Ghanaian government as an accreditation team, the NRF, and the Computer Science Teachers Association based in the US have sought his expertise. Additionally, he has been called upon to present workshops on quantitative analysis in education research and statistics nationally to staff and students in faculties of education of other universities, for example, at Rhodes University and also at the University of Zululand. Professor Desmond Gavinder's standing and recognition as a researcher and an academic are evident from the work he has performed at a national level for leading, for strategic education and for research organizations in South Africa. As you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very distinguished scholar indeed. I would now like to invite him to address us this afternoon on a topic entitled A Tabulated Learning Curve Technology Integration. Professor Gavenda, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, CV. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, good afternoon to the DVC, Professor Mkisa, 
my dean, Professor Nsibi, colleagues, family, friends, and students. I want to thank uh, UKZN for affording me this opportunity of presenting this inaugural lecture. I also want to thank uh, my students, past and present, for being part of this research journey of mine. Uh, my presentation today will address uh, a few, uh, five of these points that I've listed on the slide. Uh, basically, my research journey, uh, aspects of uh, technology adoption and uh, in industry and in education, uh, perceptual control theory, which was applied to a key finding in my own studies, then some aspects of current research that to my, I and my students are engaged in, and then some aspects of future trends. Now in deciding what to make the key focus of my presentation today, I decided to start with a small narrative about where my own research journey started and focus on key findings which continue to research. Much of this started with my PhD where I found that perceptual control theory had a key role to play in technology integration. Now, after majoring, uh, having majored in information systems slash computer science in my undergrad degree, and in the BSc honors program, working with expert systems, my concurrent practice in teacher education in computer science directed my study to digital media and the further the use of digital technology in education. Now, while my current research focus is both on programming paradigms, specifically on how to teach programming using new AI tools, I am involved in researching technology integration slash adoption in the education sector. However, today I will only focus on technology integration slash adoption in education. Now, for the purpose of this presentation today, I use the concepts uh, integration and adoption interchangeably. In a recent survey, uh, as recent as March 2021, the University of Edinburgh cited HFS as the second most influential analyst company in the UK. According to the HFS, emerging technology adoption as a people problem. Therefore, they ask the question, how can we get out of our own way to embrace change? Now, in trying to understand this people problem, the following question was posed to 400 executives and being, what are the greatest challenges creating a digital workforce and automation experience in your organization since the onset of COVID-19? And after some simple analysis, it was concluded that the problem that industry faces is fourfold. Firstly, getting employees on board using new automation. Secondly, figuring out which elements of digital technology need to be integrated. Thirdly, getting alignment and consensus on the right technology to implement. And fourthly, changing the organizational structure to embrace a digital workforce. Now, I argue that the same can be said of in the education sector. In fact, as early as 2007, my own research showed this very point, that emerging technology adoption as a people problem. And I'm going to try and use perceptual control theory and control systems to explain this this afternoon. In a nutshell, I'm trying to explain this people problem in education. Technology actually mirrors the fast-paced world we live in. Keeping up with the developments of technology is certainly an exponential learning curve for many academics and educators. Or can I say, it's certainly not a sequential learning curve. As many of you would have gathered in the last two years, it is certainly a turbulent learning curve. Just when you thought you knew it all, 
a new technology surfaces. Now, someone once said, forget all that I taught you yesterday about technology. It is no longer valid today. So how do we cater for this phenomenon to ensure that it does not unnecessarily influence technology integration? Now, knowing that digital technology has become invaluable to students, better known as the Generation Z, which means always connected, engaging students in interactive lessons that delve deep into content that require problem-solving skills is well supported by digital technology in the learning process. Today, it is imperative that we tap into the potential and preferences of all learners. The idea is to determine what buttons to press to get the digital age student interested and inspire learning. Of course, there's more to technology integration than installing a few rows of computers in a classroom. Even having just two or three computers at the back of a classroom doesn't invite technology integration. In the digital world that we live in today, technology integration is most effective when it is mobile and versatile. In the hands of students, technology becomes an inseparable part of the learning process. Now, studies have shown that many educators are not able to integrate digital technology into teaching and therefore might be doing their students a disfavor. To explain this phenomenon of educators not being able to integrate technology, I'm going to attempt to discuss how perceptual control theory was used to understand this. Now, most technology adoption models and theories were first used in commerce and industry to, to determine the best predictors of technology use. Now, I'm sure many of you listening to me today are quite aware of this, and you've seen this over and over. And may I say it has been maybe oversaturated to some extent. For example, the theory of reason action, diffusion of innovation, uh, technology acceptance models, et cetera. However, later these models were adapted and used in education to determine best predictors of technolo technology adoption amongst educators. Now, this is where my studies way back in 2007 focus. This will also tell you that much of my research is based in the quantitative paradigm. As early as 2007, it became evident that regardless of the amount of technology and its sophistication, technology will not be used appropriately unless educators have the skills, knowledge, and positive attitudes to use it. And the key here is appropriately. Now, more than 15 years later, some the same holds true, and many are still researching technology adoption in education. How do we explain it? Now, when combining constructs from all of these models and theories, the strongest construct to predict educator attitudes towards ICT integration was extrinsic motivation, followed by perceived usefulness, complexity, perceived behavioral control, and relative advantage. Now you'll notice I've highlighted perceived behavioral control, which relates quite well to the people problem that HFS was talking about. And this concept of perceived behavioral control will become clear as I proceed. Now, some findings from my research indicated that a combination of the different constructs from IS models and theory was able to account for as much as 83% of the variance in educator attitudes towards technology and thus technology adoption. At the time, this was a significant result since most previous research was only able to account for between 17% and 16 9% uh, of the variance in user intention to use technology. Now, because perceived behavioral control did feature strongly in the results, I went on to use perceptual control theory as a framework for understanding educator adoption of technology. Now, this framework considers educators use of technology by examining the goals of educators and how the use of technology might either help or hinder their goals. 
Now, PCT, perceptual control theory, is a model of behavior based on control theory. Now, if you are interested, uh, William T. Powers was a medical physicist and an independent scholar of experimental and theoretical psychology who developed the perceptual control theory model of behavior as the control of perception. Essentially, PCT maintains that human beings and all other living organisms control perceptual input or reference condition, not motor output. In other words, humans have internal goals which they strive to meet. Now, as control systems, you and I as humans act to keep our perceptions matching these reference conditions and or goals. And we do this by acting on the environment, producing effects which when combined with prevailing disturbances from the environment, produce the desired perception. Now, please stay with me and I'll attempt to use an everyday example to explain all of this. Now, this is a diagrammatical representation of a controlling system using some simple mathematical notation uh, as well. Now, using an example of a simple control system, I will explain some of these terms as we go along. For example, error signal, disturbances, reference signal, etc. Now, a simple example of a control system could either be an auto speed cruise control, which is found in a motor vehicle, which many of you commonly know as a speedo cruise, or an autopilot speed cruise control system in an aeroplane. Now, just keep in mind from your own experience of driving that it is you yourself who sets the speed of the auto speed control system. And at times, you must take over in the event of so called interferences or disturbances. Now, for today's presentation, I'm not going to use the speed of cruise that you are familiar with, but I'm going to use the alternative. Now, even though many of us, or maybe all of you are watching this presentation, may not be pilots, we are familiar with the autopilot uh, cruise control system in an airplane, which is used to keep the plane moving at a steady speed set by the pilot. Now, this example will be used to introduce us to the basic properties and functioning of a control system. So, when an autopilot system is engaged, the system will increase or decrease the amount of fuel it delivers to the engine in order to maintain the desired speed, or should I say the set speed. It achieves this through a process of sensing, comparing, and acting, with all three processes occurring simultaneously. In other words, sensing the speed, comparing it to the set speed, and then acting by either increasing or decreasing the supply of fuel. However, the action of trying to uh, provide the calculated amount of fuel will not have a predictable effect on the sense speed. What does this mean? If the pilot sets the speed at 1,000 kilometers per hour, the system can't just calculate that we will require X amount of fuel to keep the plane at 1,000 kilometers per hour. And the question is why? Because of environmental disturbances, which are not under the control of the system. For example, the condition of the air, the wind direction, will all influence the speed of the plane, which influences the amount of fuel that the plane will use. So the output of the autopilot control system that is increasing or decreasing fuel will also affect other variables. For example, engine temperature, engine noise, vibration, which are all not under the control of the system. Now, an autopilot control system shares a number of common characteristics with all control systems. Firstly, a control system does not control what it does. It controls what it senses. The system can only control what it senses to be the speed of the plane, and it does so by changing the output as required. So as a result, the autopilot system 
allows one fairly accurate to predict how long it will take to cover a certain distance, but not how much fuel it will take to get there because fuel is not under control. So since a control system control, controls what it senses, and since a human sensing of the environment is generally referred to as perception in psychology, the application of control theory to humans is now referred to as perceptual control theory. To distinguish it from control theory that is applied by engineers and physicists to non-living control systems, such as our autopilot system. So secondly, a control system's behavior is clearly influenced by its environment, but its behavior is not determined by the environment. Instead, its behavior is a function of what it perceives, in other words, senses, compared to its internal goal which can change over time. Now here lies the crucial difference between human and an engineered control system. While an engineered control systems or systems are often designed so that their goals can be manipulated by the operator, it is usually impossible to manipulate the goal of a living control system, for example, a human. We can certainly ask an educator to use computers in his teaching or attend a workshop on instructional technology. But we can never be certain that another person will comply with our wishes or be behave as requested. So finally, the relationship between perception and behavior is what we call, or what has been referred to as circular causation with neither the perception nor the behavior say, serving as an independent variable, as each influences the other reciprocally and simultaneously. In other words, while perception influences the responses in a control system, the system's response also influences its perception. Therefore, what ultimately determines how the system behaves is the reference condition. And in humans, this is considered as our perceptual preference or goals, not the perception or the behavior. Therefore, in the autopilot control system, the behavior of how the system responds is determined by the goal. And in our case, the example is maintaining a speed of a thousand kilometers. With humans, our behavior is determined by our own goal, whether it is about being a competent teacher or whether you want to be the VC of UKZM. That goal will determine your behavior. Now, the understanding of our basic control system function already provides some insight into understanding human behavior, but it's not complete. For a more complete account of complex goal oriented human behavior, such as educators using technology, it is necessary to consider a hierarchy of perception and control. So according to Powers, he maintains, all humans have goals. Humans' goals are hierarchical. In order to maintain a higher level goal, it is necessary to vary lower level goals. In other words, lower level goals serve as the means to achieve higher level goals. Now, PCT argues that human beings vary means to produce consistent ends. When there's a discrepancy between the reference condition and the perceived state of the control variable, means are varied to reduce the discrepancy to regain the desired control. Now, what does this mean? In other words, no action will be taken if there is no error signal in the system. We assume that an educator has the goal of delivering quality instruction to his learner. One reason for him to start thinking about using technology might be that he somehow feels that his teaching should improve. However, if he perceives that his instruction is excellent, his perceived input matches his reference condition, that is his goal. 
He will not change anything he's currently doing. So an error signal results from comparing the perceived input with the reference condition. Thus, either a change in the reference condition or perceived input due to environmental disturbances will result in a discrepancy between the reference condition and the perceived input, and it calls for the system to act. In this case, such a discrepancy could occur when an educator raises a standard for good teaching, maybe after reading a book or attending a workshop, or maybe serious reflection uh, on his teaching when he sees his learners falling asleep in his class. For whatever the reason, the educator realizes that whatever he has been practicing for years no longer sufficiently maintains his goal. He needs to change his practice. Now, while for an autopilot control system, there are only three possible variations of behavior. Increase fuel, decrease fuel, or maintain the same amount of fuel. There are far more choices for an educator. These choices are influenced by the goal and lower level control system. Now, if, for example, an educator reads a book about learners who are learning much more in traditional classes because their educators are using the internet, he realizes that his teaching can be much better. And his def definition of good teaching changes to encouraging learner-centered collaboration. Now, to maintain this newly set reference condition, he needs to vary his practice. So like finding key pals for his learners, having them work collaboratively with other learners in other schools you know, is an option. Having learners work on a project and publish on the web, these are all options. Since his goal is to encourage learner-initiated learning, having learners work collaboratively will also help his goal. Now, faced with all these possible options, he needs to make a decision on which one to choose. Unlike the autopilot system, the, the choice is often not very clear. However, the criteria for selection is the same, and it is the availability in maintaining the goal that he has set for himself. So for the autopilot control system, when the decrease in speed is sent, the most effective way is to increase the amount of fuel. It does so, and its goal is maintained. The educator needs to make the same decision, however, based on effectiveness and possible variation. Now, the perceived effectiveness of a possible lower level control system is an important parameter in this model, not only because it decides whether it is selected to achieve a higher level goal, but because it can often act as a disturbance causing an individual to change. So in our autopilot control system, right, which it can be used to maintain a, a steady speed, and so can a human pilot. But in terms of accuracy and the amount of disturbances caused to other goals, an autopilot system usually will do a better job and it is selected over a human pilot, but more so on a highway in the air when air traffic is light. However, the autopilot system is less flexible. Therefore, in heavy air traffic, the human pilot takes over. When a new, more effective lower level control system is available, it presents a disturbance to the higher level system that is often in search of better control. Therefore, the knowledge that technology can more effectively maintain a current condition can create an error signal in the system. So an educator may start to think about using email, not because he's decided to change his pedagogy, nor because his learners asked him, but rather because he finds using email enables him to collect submissions, give learners feedback faster, and avoids him carrying large stacks of paper around the school. In fact, Many educators use technology for that reason, that it maintains the current goal more effectively than the traditional method. How often have you seen an educator using a smart board 
only to serve the purpose of a chalkboard or a whiteboard. Now, since technology use is at a lower level of the hierarchy than pedagogical beliefs and teaching approaches, and because lower level goals are easier to vary, it is no surprise that many educators adopt technology without changing their pedagogy. Now, this is what most of our recent uh, research is telling us, especially my PhD students and other scholars. While the perceived effectiveness of a system is an important consideration, perceived possible disturbances to other goals is another one that influences an educator's decision about using technology. So back to our autopilot control system. While varying the amount of fuel provided to the engine in order to maintain a steady speed, the engine no the, the, this can affect the engine noise, the temperature, the vibration. While these variables are not under the control of the autopilot system, they can cause a disturbance to other systems, which may result in action on the control system. So for example, if the pilot dislikes noise and yet the autopilot system continues to increase fuel while ascending, the pilot may decide not to use the system. So similarly, using technology can have side effects on other higher level goals. A further hypothetical scenario regarding my example of the educator who has started to think about changing his teaching could be that he has decided to use either email or the web or in-class collaboration. But after considering the effectiveness of all three options, he ranks them in order of effectiveness. Now it is assumed for our illustration, his ranking was one, publishing on the web, two, email collaboration, three, in-class collaboration. And it, however, the educator eventually decides to use the last one, in-class collaboration. And this means he decided to use the easiest option. So the question is, why? Now the answer may simply be because it is easier. And what does easier mean? Easier firstly means two things. It causes less disturbances to other goals, and it requires less resources for which he may, which may be used to maintain other goals. So for an educator, delivering quality instruction is not the only goal he has. In addition, there may be other goals. For instance, he wants to be known as a competent educator or an intelligent person or an authority of knowledge. So using email and the web requires him to deal with computers, which he's not particularly confident. Although he has been using email and surfing the net, he's afraid he may not be able to answer learners' questions, which will disturb his goal of maintaining the image of being competent and knowledgeable. So in reality, many educators do not use technology for precisely this reason. Therefore, for various reasons, Using technology may cause or create disturbances for many educators, they're not using technology. So the final aspect of digital technology adoption by educators that this framework considers is the educator's ability to control. According to PCT, while a higher level control system supplies the goal to a lower level system, it does not tell the lower level system what to do to achieve the goal. The lower level control system has to be able to act on the environment to attain the goal. Again, in case of the autopilot cruise control system, the pilot sets the speed, but it's the cruise control system that senses the current speed, compares it to the reference speed, which was set by the pilot, acts on the difference by varying the amount of fuel to maintain the goal. So the autopilot control system can perform this task because it has the ability to control, which means two things. One, the system has a functioning structure that enables it to perceive, compare, and act when necessary. And two, 
The system has access to necessary resources with which to act. Otherwise, control will be impossible. If, for example, I mean, this sounds mundane, but if, for example, the speedometer is malfunctioning, the cruise control would not work. Or if there's no fuel to deliver, the system will certainly not be able to maintain the steady, the steady speed. So while an autopilot control system is designed to accomplish the type of control that is required, an educator may not have a functioning control system when it comes to technology. So in order to use email with his class, the educator must be able to perceive whether or not his learners receive his message. And if not, he should be able to take the necessary action to enable that communication. If he perceives himself as, as not having the capacity, it is unlikely that he will use email as a means of communication. Another component of the ability to control is the availability of resources. So just as the autopilot system needs fuel, an educator needs hardware and software to use technology. So what, while what is, is, is specifically needed depends on the available technology and the activity that the educator plans to use, the educator needs to perceive that it is or will be available to him when needed. Now, according to this framework, in spite of the perceived effectiveness of technology, educators may not use it because it interferes with other higher level goals. So when will technology become a high enough priority for the majority of educators so that they pursue it as part of their regular professional responsibility? It is therefore important to reduce the perceived disturbances to other goals resulting from using technology. However, COVID-19 may have changed because of the virtual classroom. Basic, the basic considerations of PCT framework suggest that in order to understand why educators do or do not use technology, we must attempt to look at educators from their own perspective rather than from an imposed paradigm. The framework discussed here views technology as a possible way for educators to achieve their higher level goal. However, the goal of using technology needs to man be maintained by varying lower level systems. And the framework outlines three conditions required to ensure the use of technology by an educator. So firstly, the educator must believe that, the, the educator must believe that technology can more effectively maintain a higher level goal than what he has been used to. Secondly, the educator must believe that using technology will not cause disturbances to higher level goals that he thinks are more important. Thirdly, the educator must believe that he has or will have the ability and resources to use technology. Now, this is where most of our research continue to focus, keeping in mind that in education, the context is very different from commerce and industry. And keeping in mind what was said earlier by HFS, which cited that technology adoption has a people problem. Now, over the last 10 years, technology integration adoption has gained much ground, and we have seen to have won the battle. But the question still remains, have we won the battle? Our postgrad students' research has therefore moved more towards the pedagogical aspects of technology integration and adoption. Whether technology will be used or not is more becoming, is not or not, is becoming more and more less of an issue, especially now that we are experiencing a worldwide pandemic and many are being forced to turn to technology. However, the question still remains. Are educators using technology because they are forced to with no pedagogical change? In other words, does it maintain a current goal or reference condition and therefore the use? Now, some aspects of our research are also now, uh, are now focusing not on just uh, predictors of technology integration, but also why when technology is being adopted or integrated, we are still not seeing the results we have hoped for. 
One focus area that we are looking at is investigating the, the effect of using an active pedagogic approach to teaching with teaching on technology, uh, sorry, on student learning. Unfortunately, uh, literature has shown many students do not feel excited and active in the classroom and they do not participate well and they do not want to work hard. Now, among the many reasons for disengaged students is the teaching method employed by the teacher. Literature confirms that active learning strategies should be used while teaching students. And when students were taught using active learning principles, there was an increase in their communication and classroom participation. Now on the flip side, some literature has shown that having computer devices in the classroom actually has a negative effect on academic performance. One survey revealed that teachers believe that digital technologies in the classroom were producing a generation that is easily distracted and have a short attention span. About 50% of the teachers in that survey believe that these digital technologies are hurting critical thinking and the ability to communicate face to face. The conflicting results, some indicating that technology has a positive effect, others that has a negative effect, has caused some confusion. And educators are left unsure on how to proceed while researchers are polarized in their views. Several pieces of research have been carried out actually in the pre-digital years to identify different learning approaches that can increase student engagement in the classroom. One of the earliest research was carried out at Stanford, uh, and you can see the citation there. Therefore, what is needed now is to study the impact of using an active pedagogic approach to teaching, but with technology on student learning. As identified by researchers, active learning transfers responsibility to learn from the teacher to the learner and engages the learner. There are four main categories of active learning approaches, collaborative learning, concept-oriented tasks, inquiry-based learning, and technology-enabled activities. And sometimes some active learning approaches use a combination of these four. Now to move on from perceptual control theory, the other focus area we are now looking at is the concept of augmented reality. Augmented reality is a combination of technologies that enable real-time mixing of computer-generated content with live video displays. It is a real-time device-mediated perception of a real-world environment that is closely or seamlessly integrated with computer-generated sensory objects. Hailed as a game changer, the potential of augmented reality is being realized and is being explored fast to transform the future of education. Smartphones and other mobile devices have opened up new potentials for pedagogical practices where learners have a more active role than before. Now, research also argues that it is crucial how well we will succeed in using new technologies such as tablets, smartphones, games in support for learning from the viewpoint of the development of future learning environments. With the ongoing technological development, learning and teaching practices are being challenged. For years, learners have been struggling with how to learn. A common concept is that individuals differ in how they learn and each one has their own particular learning style. Example, visual learners, auditory learners, etc. Now learning will continue to evolve. The future of learning can be transformed as we continue to discover new technology and innovative knowledge. Augmented reality could be a whole new world for education by overlaying rich data onto the real world and what we see naturally. 
though augmented reality in the classroom sector is increasing, and we have some pockets of excellence, it is important to know how the potential of augmented reality can impact in the classroom. Learners are looking forward to how augmented reality can change the world around them and provide them with a deep learning of different subject content and teach them more about what they see and how they see it. Now, augmented reality can help create three-dimensional models of almost anything. And this might be ideal for visual learners and for those who need concrete and tangible models to make the theoretical scene possible. To reiterate, augmented reality is a combination of technologies that enable real-time mixing of computer-generated content with live video displays. Now, just some examples for you to look at. So I wonder how many of you went into a store and you wished you wish you could place this piece of furniture in your room to see how it looks. Well, augmented reality seems to have the answer. Then you're in the supermarket and you're in quite a hurry and you want help with your shopping. Augmented reality seems to have the answer. And remember, it's all using your smartphone. You really want to see a multi-dimensional picture of his physique, augmented reality using your iPad. Then you're teaching your child the letters of the alphabet. He or she sees the fruit just as they would see it in your fruit basket at home. Again, using your smartphone and again, augmented reality. That little girl must be saying, this makes me feel like I'm really there. And I can even remove some body parts to see what's behind. Well, augmented reality opens up tremendous scope for using it in education via smart devices. Resulting outcomes will significantly enhance learning experiences for students and educators, making consumption of academic content more immersive and enjoyable, which in turn shall deliver impactful understanding like never before. Truly a new learning experience awaits us and truly a turbulent learning curve. The classroom of 2022 compared to that of 30 years ago, has changed drastically, with the classroom having evolved into a seabed of technological advances. The future probably holds further educational proficiency, such as biometrics, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and multi-touch surfaces. Not to, to forget quantum computing, a whole new game. In a few years, the effects of quantum computing will reach beyond the research lab, becoming a pervasive or becoming pervasive in university classrooms, and will even be available to some degree at high school level. Above all, when technology integration truly becomes routine, it's important that we bear in mind that ultimately the control is in our hands, the educator, the human. Therefore, I close with this quotation. The human spirit must prevail over technology. Thank you. It is my pleasure to rise to the podium again in order to deliver the vote of thanks. First, let me thank Professor Desmond Governor for the inspiring inaugural address that he has shared with us. As UKZN, we are proud to have you as a distinguished member of our community. The wisdom that you have shared with us today and in other circles has been documented and it will inspire generations to come. We are truly grateful to your family, your partner, 
Professor Irene Kavenda, your mom, Mama Sarah Kavenda, your daughter-in-law, sons and granddaughter, who must be the bedrock behind your successes. Today's lecture has been attended by delegates from near and far within UKZN, the province, the country, as well as beyond our borders. That is testimony to your standing in your profession. There are too many of them to mention here. We thank you all. Bearing in mind that without your participation, today's celebration will be incomplete and perhaps even without meaning. Finally, I would like to thank the Dean and Head of School, Professor Tabom Sibi, colleagues in the School of Education, the college and the university community at large for providing an intellectual home to our inaugurant. Prof. Governor, who has just completed his inaugural lecture. To the corporate relations team, ably led by Ms. Norma Zondo and Ms. Pamela Adams, thank you for organizing yet another flawless inaugural lecture. With those words, I thank you all, and may you have a good long weekend inspired by the wisdom from the mouth, the heart, and mind of Professor Desmond Gavenda. I thank you all. Well done, Des. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, in it was really, really good. So inspiring. Fantastic. Thank well done. <laughs> thank, thank you, you colleagues. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Brilliant. And thank you, Prof. CB. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for organizing. It was really, really good. Uh, thank you, colleagues. No, thank you. You're most welcome. See you at the next one. Yeah, we've got quite a bit. I think about eight or nine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have a thank good one. Yeah, so you too. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Prof. I will send you the...